Um, so uh, I will talk about Corona and the digitization of money. So why do I make this um, link? Well, first of all, um, we know now, or we see that Corona is really a catalyst for the digitization of the economy. Uh, we are experiencing this right now in this conference, which will otherwise, in other times, uh, have taken place uh, physically in Munich. Um, uh, the um, digitization in the context of Corona uh, is also affecting our uh, payments. We are already seeing now that payments with paper money are declining. People don't want to accept as much paper money as before because they're afraid it may, it may carry the virus. And electronic payments are rising. So it's just an acceleration of a trend that has already uh, started. And uh, Corona, um, or as we'd rather say, the fallout of the pandemic is also a catalyst for a change in our money system as we know it. Uh, look at uh, the soaring government debt and look at how much of it is parked on central bank balance sheets. Look at interest rates. They were already on decline before, but Corona is clearly accelerating the process. If you look at the US, rates have come down even further. So this pandemic is, is a catalyst for change, for digitalization, for the change in our money system. Now, um, what we are seeing here is creating problems. Soaring government debt is creating problems. Um, huge central bank balance sheets could uh, create problems. The end of interest could create problems. Now, what I'm trying to argue here, and I shall see how convincing I uh, will be with the feedback that you gave me, um, I would actually um, argue that digitization is not is, is a solution to, to to these problems, or at least helps to deal with these changes that we are seeing here, soaring government debt and the end of interest. Digitization allows to come back on an old plan of 100% money, which I will explain uh, in the course of this presentation. It uh, will also allow to depoliticize monetary policy, um, bring back um, the interest and facilitate, of course, payments. So this is my agenda. Let's start with why 100% money? Well, um, when you look at what uh, our present money system is doing, uh, then um, when you think uh, a little bit be deeper about it, you will realize that it's actually contributing uh, to investment boom bust and credit boom bust cycles. Recall that in our present monetary system, our fiat money system, money is created through credit extension. Um, the central banks manage the interest rate um, at which credit extension takes place. Banks use the central bank interest rate, the rate at which they can obtain reserve money uh, from the central bank. They use this as a base uh, on which they then um, put the um, credit rates they charge customers. The uh, central bank tries to find a rate and influence with this, uh, the market rate in the credit market, uh, that is equal to the natural rate, the natural rate being defined as the interest rate that equals investment and savings. But since the central banks lack um, complete knowledge and complete information to identify um, where the natural rate is and hence can put the market rate uh, where that is, since they lack this knowledge and the ability to do so, um, they tend to put the market rate um, uh, below or above the natural rate. So um, they make errors. And as they make errors, they introduce um, economic instability. Look at the case um, uh, where the market rate uh, is put below the natural rate. There's a tendency for the central bank to do that because, of course, central banks want to be nice to the real economy and um, uh, induce growth. When the market we see credit extension accelerating, investment is being funded, the economy um, goes into an upswing and eventually um, enters a boom phase. Now, when the economy is in boom times, prices rise, central banks, true to their mandate, raise the interest rate, and some of the investment that has been funded with the expectations of very low rates will not 
look, any longer look viable. We move from the investment boom to the investment bust. Um, investment drops below savings. The central banks get afraid. They cut rates. They cut them below um, the natural rate in order to bust. Um, and uh, then once they think the economy recovers, they try to come back again uh, to normal, i.e. try to move the market rate to the natural rate, but see that this will create another inst another um, uh, temporary downturn in the credit cycle or could create, so they um, lower the rate again and so on and so forth. Recall the uh, period from 2004 or five to uh, up to the corona pandemic. We have seen exactly that happening and the Federal Reserve has not really managed uh, after the financial crisis to come back to a normal level of interest rate. So, um, Credit money creates economic instability. Um, now look at this. This is uh, the um, uh, history of the United States from 1929 to 2008, where I, what I've done here is I've plotted real private domestic demand. This is this broken line, as you can see, from 1928 onwards. And then I uh, calculated the credit impulse um, uh, defined as the change um, of credit flows relative to GDP. And you can see how, especially um, in um, unusual times, such as uh, during the stock market uh, crash of 1929, um, and then later on in the financial crisis, how um, this financial cycle uh, played out. In between, we had also financial cycles, also credit boom bust cycles, but they were of smaller magnitude and not realized or recognized as such. Okay, so we talked about why 100% money. Answer, 100% money um, uh, is a way to overcome uh, the instability of the um, uh, credit money that introduces cycle. And I will show how 100% money uh, is uh, created in a moment. So why 100% digital money for EMU, for the European Monetary Union? Why a digital euro? Um, well, let's just uh, take stock of where we are in EMU. Fact is that EMU is just a cash union. Only the banknotes issued by the ECB are of uniform credit quality throughout the euro area. They are signed by the res respective um, ECB president, Mr. Draghi, until recently, now Madame Lagarde, and they are of uniform credit quality. The bank money, the money created by um, the uh, credit extension of the banks um, differs uh, not only from bank to bank that we can overcome uh, with a um, uh, national deposit insurance. No, it differs actually across countries because the um, uh, euro area countries which insure the money created by the bank um, have um, a different varying financial capacity uh, to rescue the banks when they are in trouble and therefore to rescue the money that they have created. So um, because of this uh, incomplete um, uh, building that we have, uh, people have pushed uh, to come up with a common deposit insurance, EDIS, um, in addition to um, a single supervisory mechanism for banks and a single restructuring mechanism for banks. We have SSM and SRM, but uh, EDIS is quite complicated. Um, because it actually links uh, the liability of, uh, let in, in the end, different governments together. Because uh, let's say if we have a common deposit insurance and uh, banks in some country go bust, then basically taxpayers for uh, in another country may have to to come up to make good for the money that uh, would be destroyed if these banks would be. Uh, taken out of the market. So it is, is, a, is, is a problem. Um, and as long as we have this problem, we have no full EMU, we only have a cash union. Now let's see whether we, what we can uh, do when we digitalize the euro. My point is that we can uh, basically um, uh, do away with the instability that uh, is associated with the credit money system that I talked first uh, about. And we can also um, complete European Monetary Union. Three steps we need to do uh, to get there. 
Now, let me uh, explain these three steps to you um, uh, in the, um, with, a, with a very simple framework, in a very simple uh, framework of balance sheets. When you look at uh, the um, upper balance sheet, you see a balance sheet of commercial banks. They have cash, they have um, uh, loans to non-banks, they have deposits they have, uh, of, uh, of non-banks, they have savings, equity. Uh, we have a balance sheet of central bank that has uh, foreign reserves. Uh, it has uh, given um, uh, uh, credit to, to banks. It has uh, cash and it has cash deposits of banks. Um, you will see that this that, uh, uh, these balance sheets that I've put up here are slightly different from, from the one that I've just explained because what we now do is uh, we create a secure deposit. So what we do is we take out loans to non-banks um, and we take out those loans that have been made to governments, i.e. government bonds. We sell these government bonds from the bank's balance sheets. They can, by the way, as I say this in parentheses, buy these bonds from the public in the first place so that, so that they have them. But we take these bonds out and sell these bonds to the central bank. So we put it here into the asset side of the central bank. The central bank, of course, pays for these uh, uh, bonds by putting reserve money into the account um, of the banks. So the reserve money shows up on the liability side uh, of the central bank, and it shows up on the asset side of the commercial bank. And now we use this money to cover the deposit of of the non-banks. And as you can see, we have now a system where basically um, uh, the banks have 100% reserves on the side deposits of the uh, non-banks. Everything is fully covered, no longer um, fractional reserve banking or fiat money system. So now let's uh, have a look what, how we would go about by uh, when we, when we uh, extend credits in the system. Um, the um, side deposits would be converted into savings deposits. The savings deposits uh, would be given on as loans, but of course the uh, credit, um, the borrower gets the money, right? He gets basically the, the cash and puts it in his or her account and works with it. So um, the banks would no longer create new money for credit, but they would use the existence, existing money uh, to basically fund uh, loans. Now, takes, let's uh, go to the next step and let's consolidate um, the uh, uh, balance sheets. What we do is, um, as you can see here, we have two positions which we can cancel out, the ones that are highlighted. And when we do this, we can actually bring the deposits of non-banks down to the uh, central bank uh, balance sheet. This is what it amounts to, so that it looks like this, right? Rather than have a two-tiered system, we now have a one-tiered system. We don't need to have the deposits um, of the general public sit in bank liabilities that are fully covered with bank assets that reflect, again, central bank liabilities. Now we can strike this out. We can cancel this out and put it down here. Um, and now we do. Um, uh, we look at uh, how, how this would uh, again again uh, work when we do um, uh, when we save and uh, make loans. We would uh, give these deposits that are now with the central bank over to the banks. They would give it as uh, uh, loans to um, uh, borrowers, and the borrowers, of course, are interested in getting the money to do something with it and would put it in their deposits. Now let's take the next step, which basically is to convert the secure deposit to crypto money. Why is that good? Because um, having all the money in a central bank account would be um, perhaps a bit cumbersome because the central bank would have to keep um, a large number of individual um, people's accounts. But when we convert this money into crypto money, um, then basically it can be passed on peer to peer and uh, the central bank would not have to be the central bookkeeper. And again, um, what we now have, uh, the crypto money is covered basically by uh, loans um, to uh, states, basically um, bonds that we can um, roll over 
infinitely and we don't have to pay interest on them anyway. So we have now a cover stock. Crypto money is out there. I leave paper money in there because it's a good uh, corrector for uh, the temptation by uh, uh, central bankers or governments to introduce negative interest rates. And of course, this system works like before. So we can go basically in a gradual process, step by step, from the existing credit money into a 100% um, crypto money system. Um, I call it the euro coin. Um, we create the euro coin as an asset token. It's backed by the government uh, bonds that are on uh, the balance sheet of the central bank. And we put in a smart contract in which the creation of the coin is stipulated so that politicians cannot mesh, mess around with it. Uh, it's tradable via uh, a permission blockchain in order to avoid the cumbersome Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin blockchain, which takes a long time to process. Okay, the Bitcoin fans will now tear me apart, but uh, um, let's leave it at that. Um, we have uh, the notes that check compliance with the smart uh, contract, which is a kind of electronic watermark in the transaction, like the watermark in the paper money is. Now we have to stipulate rules for the expansion of the Eurocoin volume. We can do this through the acquisition of further government bonds. But um, we uh, oblige uh, the states in, in the smart contract to distribute the newly created coins directly to their citizens as a cash dividend. I don't want the states to basically fund themselves through money creation. That would be modern monetary theory, which I don't appreciate. But if we say that they have to pay it out directly as a money dividend to their um, citizens, then um, they will have to manage their budget without being able to print money. Um, uh, if they uh, breach this obligation, if they forge money, basically the U ECB would no longer buy bonds from the delinquent state. And we can now stipulate that the increase in the quantity of coins is um, uh, uh, regulated by an kind of algorithm. We don't have to make it as rigid as the Bitcoin algorithm, but we can basically uh, 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 create a, com a committee that, uh, um, that meets once a year and uh, uh, decides by which percentage point uh, to increase uh, the money stock. Um, and this percent uh, that they choose should be related uh, to the growth rate of the productive potential of the euro area. So we, we don't need Central bankers, no many, so many economists with central banks. All that we need is uh, basically a couple of people here and see whether the euro economy is now expanding at one and a half percent or one point four percent or one point six percent. The banks get new roles. I've already showed this in the uh, balance sheet exercise that we did. That we did before. They just take deposit and lend them on to borrowers. Um, this is what the textbooks used to say, right? They don't create any more money, which the textbooks in the past or, um, don't uh, explain. Um, the banks are basically an equivalent to investment fund with the first loss insurance. The, um, the uh, uh, equity cushion that is in the bank's balance sheet is, is basically protecting the depositor from a loss out of the credit activity by the banks up to just this equity cushion. Um, if the equity cushion is used up, then basically the depositor gets the credit. It becomes the owner of the credit portfolio. Um, I would leave the um, banks the possibility to create their own money by uh, through credit extension, but I would not guarantee this by the state so that they can do it at their own risk and the depositors can actually give them money um, at their own risk. Now, the interesting thing is, and this was already uh, explained in the Chicago plan in 1933, by uh, using the um, government bonds as a permanent cover for the money stock, you can actually take a lot of uh, government debt out of the market. I'll give you here an example, pre-corona times. Pre-corona times, public debt in the euro area amounted to about 10 trillion. These are very rounded numbers. This only serves the purpose of an exercise to illustrate. 85% of GDP. Um, we had side deposit in the amount of 7 trillion euros, so about 60% of GDP. As I said, this is all before corona times. Now these numbers are much bigger. Um, we have remi remaining public debt in the market 
if we uh, take all the debt out of the market to cover 7 trillion euros of side deposit, we have then remaining in the market 3 trillion or 25 percent of GDP. Meanwhile, the ECB, of course, is acquiring many more government bonds so that additional purchases that initially seemed uh, necessary when I first presented this plan where they had only about 2 trillion uh, on, on, on uh, government debt on the balance sheet become smaller and smaller. What would be the advantages of this are to digital euro? Um, I think that um, there remains a link then in the future between natural, national budgetary sovereignty and liability because you cannot create money anymore to fund governments. The money is created basically outside the credit market. It is created um, by, if you want, a formula. Um, we end the sovereign bank doom loop. Um, you could, in this system, you could have sovereign debt rescheduling and bankruptcy of banks and money would not be destroyed. It would be there like gold. So it's possible. Of course, uh, banks and governments may be much more cautious in borrowing because uh, they would have to, know, to take into account that they cannot fall back on central banks or commercial banks to bring the money for them uh, when they can't repay their debt. We have a rule-based rather than a proactive monetary policy, which basically I like. Um, we have a dampening of the credit and investment cycles. I explained this before. We could get greater consumer benefit through currency competition because if we enter uh, the um, digital era with central bank digital money, of course, we would not ban any other uh, cryptocurrency to compete with the uh, central bank digital money. In fact, it would be welcome, it would be very welcome if there would be other digital currencies to compete because that would give the state and its central bank an incentive to actually uh, produce money for the user and not for uh, political purposes to achieve certain political ends. Um, we could actually have international transactions and uh, the reserve currency function of the euro much improved because you wouldn't have to go through the uh, US dollar anymore. Uh, once you have a digital euro um, it, that can be uh, transferred peer to peer, um, you don't have to go through uh, dollar payment facilities anymore. And uh, that would, of course, very much uh, re increase the attractiveness uh, for the euro as a uh, reserve currency and an, and an international transaction currency. Um, I should add, and I um, did not do this here on this slide because I wasn't sure whether I could make it through my allotted time slot, I should add that it would also free interest again uh, for market forces because we would not create money anymore by, manip by, manip by manipulating interest. Money would create would create it a bit differently, as I explained, and the interest would basically be determined again by the uh, savers willing to uh, give money away for a while, and the borrowers who would use that money borrow that money from savers for certain uh, purposes before they return it at interest. Thank you very much.